Welcome to season two of the Gym Plus Coffee podcast. Today's guest is Daniel Davey, a renowned performance nutritionist from Ireland, widely recognized for his expertise in sports nutrition and wellness. Daniel has worked with elite athletes and sports teams, including Leinster Rugby and the Dublin Senior Football Team, helping them optimize their on-pitch performance through tailored nutrition. Daniel is now continuing his journey away from professional sport as founder of Davy Nutrition, an educational platform that promotes evidence-based nutritional guidance for those who seek it. Daniel empowers individuals to make informed decisions about their diet and lifestyle. He combines his passion for food with a scientific approach, offering practical advice that improves both physical and mental performance. He's a really interesting guy with a very unique outlook on life. Hope you enjoy the chat. Daniel, very welcome to the Jim Plus Coffee podcast. Thanks a million for coming in and I'm really looking forward to chatting to you. Great, great to be here and uh, looking forward to the chat. Uh, so first off, just I suppose we get the basics out of the mm-hmm. way. Um, some people listening might be familiar with you, some people might not. So it might be great if you just gave us a kind of a whistle stop tour, what's been going on with you for the last 10 years, uh, even before that, just your background, your interests, and then and then maybe how your career has uh, evolved from that. And then we can kind of dig into different areas if that's okay. Sure. I, I think no matter how many times I give this quick summary, uh, the parts are still always important. And I, I don't like glazing over it and saying, oh, I said this before. So your upbringing is massively formative. And I grew up in a very, very small, initially a very small cottage in a place called Chaffpool in Sligo. Uh, we uh, had a small farm, sheep and cattle and then I actually still have that uh, sheep farm so my mum is looking after it now and I always bring that up because that's still it's what I love to get home to and spend a bit of time on so grew up uh, in rural Sligo very very heavily influenced by nature by farming and by good food so all I wanted to do with my time as a young a a, a young fella in, in rural Sligo was farm and play football that that was it and then when you came in from working hard there was this kind of experience of of the food that you would have that was my grandparents and on both sides cooked great food from from home and from their garden and um, it was like that connection between good food hard work and being strong Mm -hmm. so that was the first formative uh, influence that I had and then it was all about performance. I wanted to be the best possible sports person I could be. And I don't know where that, that like insatiable drive to play a sport came from. Um, but it was there from a very, very, very young age and still is to this day. So uh, fast forward into school I was absolutely terrible in school hated school barely got into college failed maths like I mean all I wanted to do and I've told this story many many times I wanted to spread slurry I wanted to draw in silage and drive tractors and play football like school was just at the the very very bottom end of my priorities but then when I did I as I said I scraped into college I started to realize this learning thing wasn't a bad thing. And I started to see that there was potentially a career in understanding the link between how we live. So our behaviors, food, nutrition, and going back to that concept around performance. And one of my closest friends, Brendan Egan, was ahead of me on that pathway uh, to become a performance nutritionist. He was playing in, in Sligo, like you've pretty much one option is play Gaelic football, or if you're from the town, you play soccer. So uh, those conversations evolved week on week, month on month, and I realized that was the direction I wanted to go. Skip forward uh, another, you know, through college, getting my qualifications. I worked a bit in a, a sports supplement brand for a couple of years while getting my first start with the Dublin Hurlers. Then a year later, I got an opportunity because of a really good friend and because of someone who believed in me and that I was able to work at that high level uh, in sport, gave me the opportunity to work with Dublin football. And then six weeks later, Leinster Rugby, and that's been 
that's been a major part of the last 12 years of my life up until two years ago where I decided to go on my own. Well, that's a great story. Um, was when, when you said you, you got first got into the performance nutrition, like ma <clears throat> marrying those together, was performance nutrition an actual thing back then or were you more kind of forging a, a potential career or a path? It was a thing, but it absolutely wasn't really a career. So if you think about the number of jobs when I would have qualified as a sports nutritionist back in 2009, there was uh, the Irish Institute of Sport, uh, there was the IRFU, uh, like the Irish rugby team, senior rugby team had a nutritionist, and like most inter-county teams didn't even really have that much nutrition support uh, here and there. So I, I, like I actually do take great pride in having, I guess, really taken the opportunity to put a spotlight on something that is very, very important for performance. Um, since then, there is far greater awareness of the lifestyle component and recognizing if you want to perform at your best, the lifestyle, not just the nutrition, but how you recover and how you prepare your body has a, has a major role to play in that. And now, like you go into any local shop, there's some emphasis somewhere on nutrition or protein bars or some rubbish. <laughs> And going back to that 10 years ago, 2012, you know, yeah. whatever year it was there, what were the, I don't want to make this about elite sport or anything because it might not be accessible for everybody, but what were the conversations that were happening back then around performance nutrition in those kind of elite levels where was the education a lot, a lot higher than you might have thought, or was it like we're going in kind of at a relatively basic education level? I think what you find out very quickly about elite sport is that there's athletes within that environment that are not just really smart. They're really clear on the things that influence their performance because they want to be the best. So if you, like, there's athletes come straight to mind, like the likes of Jamie Heaslip, early doors, uh, Owen Redden and Brian O'Driscoll, Rob Kearney, I was blown away by their practice. I did think I was going to come in and that there was something novel about how I was going to influence performance, whereas really you're, you're just, there's the reassurance and there's just making sure that they're well facilitated. They've been professionals for 10 plus years, but there's a spectrum. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum. Uh, like, I don't know. I don't mind saying this is not name dropping. These are this is just the reality of working with someone who is like Sean O'Brien has become a really good friend of mine. And like the first time he had a pepper or a really chopped vegetables was when we lived together. So you've got the other end of the spectrum where somebody who's got a very high level of talent and they're unique in so many ways. You're so unique, Sean, if you ever hear this. <laughs> uh, they have that, that mindset and that ability and that physical prowess <clears throat> to perform. And even if their nutrition is substandard, they're still able to reach that world-class level. Right. Um, and around those times, was there differences between, say, Dublin football, and not those specific groups, but, you know, <clears throat> kind of amateur level Gaelic football versus professional rugby? Was there different kind of education <sighs> levels there? It was remarkably similar, okay. remarkably similar. And I think the thing about amateur sport is that you've got very different challenges. It's around resources and time. But you also had the same type of personalities who had, you know, they had previously worked with nutritionists and they had figured a lot of stuff out themselves and done a lot of reading. Uh, again, that spectrum existed, but you had people who... Uh, the, like the Paul Flynn's and people like that who extraordinary detail and would have tracked their food and would be able to give you pretty good insights to what they were doing. And then you had people even doing sports science and you had like worked with Brian Cullen, who's was head of performance then uh, for Dublin football since retiring. So I, I, I like Dublin football and GAA in general, there's no question it is at the highest level in terms of preparation physical now and and mental uh, as anywhere in elite sport anywhere 
Yeah, it's so funny when people make those comments from the outside and they just say, oh, these are elite athletes, they're just not professional. But it is true from everyone you speak to, whether it's sports psychologists or nutritionists or whoever's involved, it's like you, you can't get higher than this. It's just no. that they have jobs as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is pro actually probably why you see most of the inter-county players now are either, you know, they're involved in third level education or they're teachers because mm. like the lifestyle is it's tough going for a lot of them. No, it is tough going. It um, is tough going. So your few years there at, a, at a, an extremely elite level it would be hard to get past uh, or get higher than the Dublin footballers and Leinster rugby in the last 10 years uh, in any sport. What have your observations been on, say, like broader society at the same time? Because we kind of started at the peak level there of maybe awareness levels and, and performance. But w what have you seen happening in the last 10 years in terms of the journey the broader public has has gone on? We spoke about... Well, in most stores now, you'll see some sort of re reference to nutrition or health. Mm. But what what have your been observa What have your observations been there? The observations are that we have never had more information about uh, nutrition and our health than we have now. Uh, but the levels of confusion and misinformation in the space has also never been as high, which has resulted in different types of problems. So. You've got more extreme behavior. You've got uh, people with really negative relationships with food. Uh, you've got different forms of of eating disorder type behavior. I don't work in that space myself, but I work with a lot of people who come to me with obsessive type tendencies, with not even knowing how to live their life without tracking food. So you've got the improvement in our knowledge and access things like my fitness pal and all of this type of thing that should improve our understanding and society's health. But uh, you've, if you look at then the stats, the population stats, they're only going one way. Mm. We're seeing higher and higher levels of overweight, obesity, type two diabetes, like none of this stuff is going away. It's only getting worse. So you've got people who, like it's almost like the people who are interested become almost borderline obsessed and then you've got the other percentage of society where there's there's the socioeconomic challenges there's the price of food there's the education component and so much of this is like what are the family values and what have they been exposed to what type of schools do they go to what are the teachers like so uh it's a it's incredibly complex because we um as i said the information is not the problem. Sorry, it, the availability of information. It's always about the quality and how people can engage with that information. And so that might bring us nicely on to, you said a couple of years ago, you made the leap to, I suppose, come out of what many would see as an amazing role at an elite level. Sure, a lot of people would be you know, envious to be in that position. What made you make that leap and... So what are your experiences now when you're you're not in, you're not in that elite kind of uh, environment anymore? You're kind of more out in the open. Like what what made you do it first, and then and now what what have your experiences been? I like that question um, because it wasn't an easy thing to do, but it was without doubt the right thing to do. So all I ever wanted was uh, to work with elite teams in Ireland. Um, I wanted to work with the best athletes. All I wanted to do was try and support the likes of Dublin football players, Leinster rugby players, and then the players that played for Ireland. Like that was the, that was the vision. But when you're in elite sport, it it's not just the hours that you do. You you have to live it in every way. So it's the game at the weekend and how that will shape the mindsets of everybody within the environment from Monday morning. Uh, so it's all in consuming, like it's all consuming. So there's a couple of parts to it. There's the there's the lifestyle part, having a young family. There's also there's a very real reality of everybody having a timeline within these environments. So whether it be an athlete or whether it be a staff member, once you go in, there's the freshness, there's the excitement, there's the energy, there's the they're always willing to go above and beyond for your role and I always did that 
but as life goes on and you go into your 30s uh, that that changes but also no matter how good you are if people become very familiar and they see the same face and they see the same kind of themes the reality is that it can become a little bit stale so my biggest challenge was always evolution always but my instincts were that the time was right and i also personally and i've said this uh, and this is important to me while they were my dream jobs they're not what is defining me as daniel davy and if I really believe that, and that's become a big part of my philosophy, is actually helping people to figure out what the like what what way they want to live their lives from a behavior perspective, from a routine perspective, and what the picture looks like. I have to live that myself, and I do that the best way I can. Great. I mean, <laughs> that sounds like a great uh, purpose and mission to have. And we spoke about this before we even started recording, but it's quite evident straight away when you go onto your social media accounts or your your website or what events you've come up that now that you're kind of out into the open that this is not this is not confined to how can i help people with nutrition it it's not even like how can i help people with performance it's it's just more overall well-being and lifestyle and health i guess has is that has that been your experience as you've kind of gone out on your own and you've just started to try to help people that it's just automatically just broadened straight away oh, i'd love to say automatically uh nothing has been automatic in my life um but it rarely is for anybody but i i, I again i like that we've segued into that because that's been really important to me and i've learned a huge amount about myself in the last two years and the vulnerabilities of being a business owner but also the vulnerabilities of being out there with the idea of leading in this space, like trying to lead again in a, in a very different way, but with, without any blue jersey behind you, these uh, you walk into a room, <clears throat> and you're if it comes up, it's not like you're immediately trying to say that you work with these teams, but if it comes up, immediately there's a there's a standing and there's a respect. I've seen every time I've played golf, if it happens to come up about where you work, you can just feel people are more engaged. So you don't have that anymore. But the biggest learning I've had, and this is kind of why I go back to why I like this part of the conversation, is because people come with a perceived nutrition challenge or problem or goal. But in my experience, it's never that. It's never actually nutrition that, well, sorry, it's not never. It can be on occasion. But most often inconsistencies are coming from other aspects of life. They're coming from not dealing well with stress. It can be fatigue. It can be stress. It can be poor time management. It can be grief. It can be loneliness. It can be lots of things that manifest in not understanding behavior and consistency. And then the compounding self-talk that results from feeling like, hold on a second. I know this shit. I should be able to do this, but not being able to figure out why. So it's being able to help people talk through those things and finding the right place and finding the right pathway for that. And people think so much of this fitness and nutrition space is easy. But, you know, I don't know how long we've been talking for maybe 20, <laughs> 20, 20 minutes. It's not really complex. And... Uh, if you think about the work that you do or the systems that you're involved in, it takes time to learn all of these things. But most of our behaviors are just, we're on autopilot. They're automated behaviors. So we have this, the world around us telling us about what we should do. And we have all this information about how we can look a certain way. But no knowledge or real skills on how to get there. And then this is the obvious thing that's talked about repeatedly. People think this should be easier, get deeply frustrated with the lack of progress and go, fuck it, mm. fuck it, no, this is just, is bullshit. I might as well get the takeaway and finish the bottle of wine. Yeah, they want faster results than what they're seeing. Everybody does. Yeah. And the science is so clear about how slow all of these changes are, but people are not engaged enough in the content to understand it.
I hope you're enjoying the episode. Just to let you know, we have a special discount code for podcast listeners. If you go to our website and enter POD15, you will get 15% off. That's POD15 for 15% off on all Gym Plus Coffee websites. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify or wherever you normally get your podcasts and turn on that notification button so you never miss an episode. Now let's get back to the chat. This is going to sound like a kind of an odd question, but so then how do you help people through your business? Because everything you said there makes sense at a human level. Yes. But, you know, from a business point of view, you obviously have an area of expertise. I'm sure you can bring in partners that have other. Yes. But you, you can't all of a sudden take a client on board and then be like, we're going to fix everything, every aspect of your life. <laughs> so how does that work for you? at a business level and then maybe even while in answering that you could kind of explain to people who are listening you know mm. what it is the business actually does you know at a kind of bread and butter well the business side of it is a nightmare commercially but I love it <laughs> I absolutely I I think about all of the time that I spend trying to help people figure this stuff out and I think about how bad business sense a lot of it is and how poor and how inefficient so many of the processes are but the one key thing i know this is like this is in undisputed is that when somebody is ready for a good conversation i'm good at that i'm a good listener and most people are not listened to or most people don't have somebody that is list that is going to really take the time to listen to them about their health so you can figure out an awful lot with somebody about their health and what their priority is by just listening. But if you think about, like, somebody wants to tell you about the chicken sandwich that they had for lunch, like, who gives a shite about the chicken sandwich? But they care about their chicken sandwich. And it's like, that has a certain amount of protein in it that they need to dial up, or usually dial up, that's, you know, it's a very simple, but, you know, I, do, I skip breakfast or whatever. Nobody cares about that. But I, <clears throat> I care about how that fits into people's picture and jigsaw. So um, I went off on a bit of a tangent there between <laughs> it, being a, it being a nightmare too. I love it and I love trying to figure it out. And I truly just, there's something indefinable in me. You mentioned human, and I love that you mentioned human. There's something in all of this that I keep thinking about that space. Mm. And that that it will, I will figure that other part out. And you kind of are figuring it out already, aren't you? Because if you look at just the events that you have coming up, let's mm. say this month, uh, that's so broad already. You know, can you tell people, if, like, how did that come about and... Yeah, what, what's happening across those kind of few days that you have planned just so people understand that you are actually already kind of addressing some of the things you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and it's amazing you are having to pull that out of me. It just says so much about how shit I am at selling. <laughs> I guess what we realized is that as a team, because that's really important to say that we are a team. There's Eva and, and Gemma and there's Lauren and there's Casper and I... I really did recognize very quickly after coming out of those uh, teams <clears throat> that I work best as a team and we having these types of conversations about how do we figure all this stuff out. It's impossible. To, well, I would find it impossible just to figure out in my head. So the concept of camp. So when I was in camps in, in those sports teams, there are some of the best memories I have down in Doombeg with Dublin or the camps that we would have done in in in, um, in Wicklow or whatever with, uh, with, with Leinster and any of the kind of travel stuff just brings people together, removes the mundane and they they allow people to focus on themselves in a very different way and all of the distractions, not just your phone, but your commitments, your work and like obviously family your health and your family is your ultimate priority, but what people don't actually get is how critical it is to invest in oneself and lead oneself first and then being able to then give more to the family. So we started running these events and they were just like, we didn't get it all right, but people were coming to understand, like the premise is that you train together with people who are like-minded and you learn about what we've talked about 
nutrition and exercise and sleep and you understand these components of health in better detail and you've got a template to go away with. But what was happening was people were really tapping into this I, this connection concept of mm. actually learning from each other. So it's, it's nothing to do with me. It's just... They appreciate that someone's facilitating yes. it, but they're not putting pressure exactly. on you to own it, you know. And I absolutely realized that very early and allowed, and then the more you step back, the more you you encourage people to share and that whatever, that within reason, you know, you mentioned skill set very early on. <clears throat> We're not talking about dealing with uh, serious mental health issues or trauma or anything like that, but we are talking about how the day to day life is so heavily influenced by your mood and your energy and recognizing what's affecting that. And people start to go away and think about the way they live differently. So uh, one of my favorite references or testimonials is from my sister. My sister came in the last uh, one, Marianne, came to Portugal and she said she's sitting back and she's like, it's like being a celebrity athlete, but you don't have to, like you don't have to do all this crazy, crazy training. You, do, you operate at your own level, but the food is there and you're around people and you have that support or infrastructure. And she said, it just gets you to think differently about your own time and value and really what's important. And no matter how many times, like you're sitting here in front of me and, you know, no matter how many times you have that conversation with somebody just like this or over coffee, it's not the same as being totally embedded and removed from everything around you. Because you really have to think about it. It's interesting you use a few words there, which is which is great, which is like support and infrastructure, mm. you know, which is kind of very intentional. So if you're in the zone, basically, there's going to be people around you who are going to help you really focus on things. But you're going from like switching on, switching off. And the other opposite of that, we mentioned just being on autopilot. And the majority of people, the vast, vast majority of people in the world never experience going into camp going out of camp exactly they just experience probably following the school calendar year yes and then having two weeks holidays somewhere and then going back to autopilot again so it's actually harder for them to change gears because they're just living a kind of a normal life <laughs> you know um you so would swear we scripted this <laughs> yeah there's another, Genuinely. Word, there's another word you mentioned, uh, which I stood out for me because it, it stands out for Jim Plus Coffee, I think. You mentioned loneliness mm. earlier, and we basically spent a whole year uh, talking to our community about that last year. But that plays such a bigger role into this. And also, I'm not saying that all uh, professional athletes who, or not even professional athletes, athletes who play elite team sport, I'm not saying nobody there isn't lonely. But they do have that support network. They have a framework for improvement and they always have someone to go to in different areas like sports psychology, nutrition. You can go to talk to someone. And again, I'm not saying people don't have their own challenges in those environments, but it is people are fighting loneliness and they're, tr they're actually having to do that on their own, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I like you should have done this on your own. You, you, you don't need me here at all. <laughs> that is so true, and it's actually why when I came out of working with sport, that's what hit me smack bang wallop in the face. It was this 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 greater purpose around all of the good behaviors <clears throat> was inherently there when you walked in the door. You were attached to something. For whatever length of period that you were there, you were attached to that purpose and you had that purpose. And then that's that's the thing about coming out of there. <clears throat> you realize how powerful that is. And that's a big element of this higher path that I'm talking about, uh, that I get people to engage in this longer term vision. And if you engage in that longer term vision, you've got a different picture in your mind and there's a different set of decisions and thoughts that will go through your head if you think about this stuff but it goes back to that autopilot thing you have to be ready 
for the questions that we will ask or that you ask yourself. And there has to be that time available to you. And there's an actually a maturity level associated with it as well. But if you ask me now, and <clears throat> if you ask me, it'd probably be even different three years ago. But I think about performance in the everyday. And I think about engaging that concept with people an awful lot more. So I always use this very simple reference for myself that I don't want to participate, I have young kids, I don't want to participate with them in their games in 10 years or 12 years time. I want to compete. <laughs> I'm serious, like we golf. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting a boogie. If we, if we ever go skiing, we use this all, example all the time, it's not daddy can, like his back is sore or he's not able to do this. I, w I still want to be, them to be proud of me <clears throat> because I've done the work now to be in a position to to play with them. And I'm an older, I mean, relatively speaking, I'm an old, I've got very young kids and I'm 41. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it, 20 years ago, somebody who's 50 odd, I don't know if they're, yeah, they got this type of mentality, but like you see an awful lot more people like that now who yeah. are the marathon runners in their 60s or we see people and we're exposed to people who are staying strong and staying functionally strong and staying fit. No matter how many people you see online that do that, that's a serious body of work. Yeah. And the reality is that at, at the latter stages of life, you will probably live longer due to medicine. So you, you should probably go, be in good enough shape because you don't want to prolong poor years. <laughs> you know, you want good quality years. Life in our years, not the length of your life. So yeah. it's like, yeah. what's your level of function, which is really important. Uh, switching gears slightly because just because we spoke about kind of connection and bringing people together um i know there's pros and cons of what we're going to talk about but social media mm -hmm. what role play <clears throat> what role does that play you obviously have a you have a large social media presence how has that how has that been a benefit to you how do you feel about that how do you manage it and also i'm sure there are kind of slight negatives to social media for you as well so how have you like it, it is quite a large following that you have um i think it's a large following in the sense that it's not dedicated to like you've got people who do food and they've got large followings because recipes are you can like if you want to go viral or want to grow a following just do loads of very easy recipes i don't want to be that person and i don't want to just do healthy food <clears throat> because of everything we've talked about mm -hmm. so it's, it's quite complicated yeah Social media has felt like a wonderful outlet for me. The way that people talk about uh, journaling and reflection. Um, I've really enjoyed how, uh, you actually said um, before we came on, you mentioned about somebody <clears throat> sending you a direct email about the podcast and the value of some of the conversation. Like I will get from time to time not just a uh, good content or something like that. I'll, I'll see somebody really engage in something that I'm trying to say that see even further behind what I'm trying to do. And that's, um, that feels good. Now, the downsides are probably a little bit different and, and, and very much surprise people when I say this type of stuff. When you come from a sporting environment, Growing a social media presence and being present on social media is a very complicated thing. So it's not liked, you know, it's just, it isn't. And because you share too much. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you need to be very careful about what you share. And like, I have one intention with my content. And that is to educate. So whatever I'm using or whatever I'm sharing is about that purpose. But I'm also now trying to run a startup business. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's there's a there's this kind of the the insight and there's the intellect and there's the experience that is is really interesting. And I ultimately want 
to have that very high level of integrity with what I do. <clears throat> and I still want to be a performance director, whatever I haven't, I don't know what it is. It has started, like the career started as a performance nutritionist, but it's evolving very, very quickly into something a, a lot more holistic in, in the space of performance. So that's a constant challenge for me. Okay. Not the negative feedback about my recipes, taste, <laughs> taste of shite. I don't give a fuck about any of that. <laughs> Um, I have one last question for you and I hope that it kind of sums up a lot of what we spoke about um, and I may, I may need to extend the length of the question to give you time to think about it uh, but so much of what Chimbus Coffee has done over the last seven years is just to focus on community building community around a shared passion <clears throat> um, and that can be all different passions at the same time if you know what I mean it's just like minded people coming together with the best of intentions, I think. Um, what does community mean for you now? Um, and what does it mean in relation, I suppose, to, let's say, your experiences at your events, mm. with the work <clears throat> that you do? And it doesn't need to be, you know, a perfect answer, but it's just more, I suppose, again, going back to the start of the conversation, like just what are your observations on what you think community is now for people? Okay, well, I think that there's probably uh, two versions of the answer. And the first version is that I'm from a very small rural part of Ireland. And I grew up where the, the door is never locked. And it's always safe. And uh, you could walk in the door. This is not like me making up some stories. Like you could walk in and there could be a fresh loaf of bread just baked or somebody has dropped down a curry because they want to and they want to do something really nice for you so or somebody just drops in for a cup of tea so my whole upbringing and experience is about being a part of something very very special in our local community I ran an event all of my events not just not just uh, like let's say for example I did my book launch at home uh, I've ran a, a charity event off off the of called the shepherd's run across the back of my farm uh with, with the local community and it's it's indefinable like what that blanket of support feels like you know my dad passed away what that looks and feels like like that is it goes so far beyond <clears throat> it is humanity it is just the the, it, the greatest thing about being a part of something that means something you know you're really mm -hmm. deeply connected to those around you that's one part that's my first instinctive response the second part is the community associated with what your what your philosophy is and what your values are and what you're trying to do for people and there's a there's layers to it because i know that it starts with that one-to-one -one and then the the more that you spend that time with people the the more that they can understand you and you can understand them and it's trying to create opportunities for more people who feel like that uh, to, to engage um, and going back to that kind of loneliness saying the best thing that's ever happened with anything that we've ever done is where people come together and feel supported and then like we have, I actually showed this to somebody last night. We have this diagram of everybody that's come through our, you know, our programs or what are the words that people are using? And the most common thing that comes out is confidence. And we never anticipated that this, these were, so it's clarity in the information and it's confidence and energy. And you're trying to create as many opportunities for people to feel like that. Wow. That's uh, powerful stuff. I'm sure <laughs> incredibly motivating. Uh, it's a great way to finish it, I think. Thank you very much for uh, coming in to chat to us and uh, best of luck for the future. Thanks. Thanks very much. I thoroughly enjoyed that chat. Thanks for listening to the Gym Plus Coffee podcast. If you enjoyed these conversations, don't forget to follow us on Spotify or wherever you normally get your podcasts and turn on that notification button so you never miss an episode. Don't forget we have a special discount code for podcast listeners. Go to our website and enter POD15 for 15% off. 
That's POD15 for 15% off on all Gym Plus Coffee websites. Thanks for listening.